Vesele via noci. Vesele via noci. Which is, of course, Slovak for Merry Christmas. Merry Everyone Christmas. knows that. Everyone knows that. But Honestly. I don't know why we're still doing Merry Christmas. We're now, we're now in 2020. But anyway. Well, because the 12 days of Christmas. Oh, yes, of course. Epiphany. Okay. Yeah, 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 fair point, fair point. Anyway, we're, we're getting near the end of our series of 12 book extracts. I think it's book extract number 11 today. Art. Um, it's your turn now. What is it? Guy Sagier. Ah, oh, yeah. The Forgotten course. Soldier. Now, yeah. um, this is a book about an Alsace... French German. Strictly German, speaking, it's a novel, German. isn't it? It's strictly speaking a novel. There's some debate about uh, about some of this book's accuracy, but strictly speaking, it's a novel. But strictly speaking, he absolutely was on the Eastern Front from what you read in this book. I think there's no way there's no way that he conjured this up out of thin air. Um, and it is a it is a classic of the German eyewitness genre. I yep. would say. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. O Weihnacht. Christmas night, 1943. The wind howled through the labyrinth of trenches north of Boporovska. Two companies occupied the positions prepared by the security division and the Todd organization, which had since withdrawn to the west, beyond the Bessarabian frontier. We had settled into these ice-coated molehills two days earlier. The front seemed solid, and we would almost certainly be fighting soon. The collapse of our southern front had forced this last retreat and regrouping along this line. The vast Soviet thrust was moving inexorably and slowly towards us, like a steamroller. We were well aware of this, and the continuous build-up of reinforcements in our sector led us to foresee a violent clash. The country immediately around us was hilly and wooded. Tanks and mobile artillery waited in the frozen underbrush and terrible cold which stripped the bark off the trees. The stocks of provisions in Boporovska had been repeatedly plundered. Our commandant had tacitly consented to a few days of carousal, as if to compensate for the impending Holocaust. It was Christmas night. Despite our miserable circumstances, we were filled with emotion, like children who have been deprived of joy for a long time. Under our steel helmets and behind our silent faces moved a crowd of glittering memories. Some men talked of peace, others of childhoods which were still very close trying to hide their feelings and hopeless, ludicrous dreams by hardening their voices. Vez Rydow made his round of the trenches, talking to the men, but his words seemed only to be disturbing private reflections, and he soon withdrew into his own. He too undoubtedly had children and wished to be with them. Sometimes he stopped for a moment and looked up at the sky which had cleared. The frost glittered on his long coat like spangles on a Christmas tree. For four days we had to endure nothing more severe than the cold. The sections in the line were relieved continually and the unbearable nights were divided into two parts. Each day brought fresh cases of pneumonia. Frostbite had become commonplace. Twice I was carried into an isba and brought back to consciousness and life from the brink of death. Our faces were badly cracked, particularly at the corners of the lips. Fortunately we had enough to eat. The cooks had been given special orders to prepare our food with as much fat as possible. Supplies arrived regularly, which enabled Grants to produce gluey soups full of margarine. These concoctions were nauseating but effective. Our cooks had learned something about cold weather cooking from the ingredients of Russian soups. We also took saunas, a horse doctor treatment which didn't coddle any weaklings. We moved straight from the hot steam into cold showers, a transition so violent that our hearts often threatened to stop beating. Like Gansk's greasy soups, however, these shocks were effective, and we always felt better afterward. Make the most of it, Gansk told us. Eat up and enjoy it. In Germany, kids are going without dessert, so you can have this. Alas, Gansk's words were too accurate. As Paula explained in a letter which reached me in only six days, rationing had become very strict. We were getting much closer to our own frontier, and every day the distance from home seemed smaller. Soon Germany at bay would no longer be able to send us even margarine. One morning, the Feldwebel's whistles drove us from the overheated Izba where we slept. A patrol of Soviet tanks was just over a mile from Boporovska. The cold, as we ran outside, was like a blow from the butcher's axe. Each man galloped to a precise point. We had not yet reached our positions when the sound of heavy explosions shook the thin air to the west of us. Russian tanks charging like maddened bulls had driven into our minefield. Now it was the turn of Russian tank crews to go up in smoke. Our observers were watching through their field glasses. Almost all the tanks were trying to withdraw the way they'd come. 
our artillery remained silent, leaving the tanks to the mines. Firing might even set off these traps. However, three Stalin tanks had managed to cross the minefield and were driving towards the town in a roar of chains and exhaust. With extraordinary courage, they took the fire of our 37 anti-tank guns without slowing down, only to be hit by our camouflaged Tigers with their terrible 88s. In a sequence as unreal as anything Hollywood could have contrived, all three tanks were hit by the first salvo. One turned over and exploded. Another stopped dead like a boar hit behind the shoulder. The third, although hit, turned without stopping, exposing its flank to our anti-tank machine guns, which ripped off all of its protruding guns. It continued in a circle broken by a series of banking turns, trying to execute a half turn. This dramatic attempt left us gasping with admiration. In his will to survive, the Russian driver headed straight for our minefield. A series of explosions ripped the tracks off his left side, and the tank slowly settled like a vanquished beast. As the thick black smoke began to pour from its entrails, two dark figures climbed out. But our cold, stiffened fingers did not fire. Both Russians were holding their pistols, prepared to defend themselves. When they didn't hear any guns, they took a few steps towards our lines, then threw down their guns and raised their hands. A moment later, they were crossing our front line. The Lanza, who considered them heroes, grinned, and the Russians grinned back, their teeth gleaming very white in the smoke-blackened faces. Our men took them to an Isber and gave them some schnapps. Their attitude and performance seemed so far removed from those of the partisans that we felt no hate for them. Lenzen watched them for a moment and said, if Vina were here, he'd probably drink a toast with them. During the following night, we sent out patrols to relay the minefield. Our defensive fighting was relying increasingly on mines to take the place of weakened or missing lines. The next day, there was a general reinforcement at the front. Two Romanian regiments and a Hungarian battalion were sent to join us. We were told that we would also have the support of a squadron of fighter bombers based somewhere near Vinitsa. It seems we're getting ready for a big show, Fairman observed. I don't like it. Obega fighter Lenson took the opposite view, rejoicing in our increased strength. As he saw it, the red tide must be stopped here. The idea that Prussia itself would soon fall into enemy hands never even crossed his mind. But then, that was true of all of us. One night, the Russians sent a human wave of Mongols in a direct assault against our positions. The function was to knock out the minefield by crossing it. As the Russians preferred to economise on tanks, and as their human stockpile was enormous, they usually sent out men for jobs of this kind. The Soviet attack had failed, but Stalin hadn't been looking for success. The minefield exploded under the howling mob, and we sent out a curtain of yellow and white fire to obliterate anyone who'd survived. The fragmented cadavers froze very quickly, sparing us the stench which would otherwise have polluted the air over a vast area. The Russians had not even used any of their artillery to help the Mongols, which seemed to confirm our estimate of the situation. We sent out patrols to try to remine the field, but the Russians were ready to fire on anything that moved. We were able to put down only a light sprinkling of mines, with regrettably heavy losses. It was clearly no longer possible to rely on mines to protect our front lines. On another evening, when the cold had attained dramatic intensity, the Russians attacked again. We were manning our positions in a temperature which had dropped to 45 degrees below zero. Some men fainted as the cold struck them, paralysed before they even had a chance to scream. Survival seemed almost impossible. Our hands and faces were coated with engine grease, and when our worn gloves were pulled over this gluey mixture, every gesture became extremely difficult. Our tanks, whose engines would no longer start, swept the spaces in front of them with their long tubes like elephants caught in a trap. The Mujiks preparing to attack us were suffering in the same way, freezing where they stood before there was time for even one Ura Pobida. The men on both sides suffering a common martyrdom were longing to call it quits. Metal broke with astonishing ease. The Soviet tanks were advancing blindly through the pale light of flares which intensified the bluish glitter of the scene. These tanks were destroyed by the mines which lay parallel to our trenches some 30 yards from our front lines, or by our Tigers which fired without moving. The Russian troops with frozen hands and feet faltered and withdrew in confusion in the face of the fire we kept steady, despite our tortured hands. Their officers, who had hoped to find us paralysed by cold and incapable of defence, were unconcerned about the condition of their own troops. They were ready to make any sacrifice, so long as our lines were attacked. I managed to keep my hands from freezing by thrusting them in their gloves into two empty ammunition boxes when the cartridges had run into the spandau. 
Our gunners and everyone forced to use his hands sooner or later turned up at the medical service with severe cases of freezing. There were a great many amputations. The intense cold lasted for three weeks, during which the Russians restricted themselves to sending over music calculated to make us homesick and speeches inviting us to surrender. Toward the end of January, the cold lessened somewhat and became tolerable. At times during the day, the thermometer rose as high as five degrees above zero. The nights were still murderous, but with frequent shifts of duty, we managed to get through them. We knew that the Russian offensive would soon resume. One night, or one morning rather, toward four or five o'clock, blasts of the whistle sent us out once again to our interception posts. A mass of T-34 and Sherman tanks were moving forward in a loud roar. An artillery bombardment had preceded them, inflicting heavy damage on Boporovska and provoking a mass evacuation by the civilian population, which had been waiting for the fighting in terrified apprehension. Our tanks, about 15 Tigers, 10 Panthers and a dozen Mark IIs and Threes, had managed to start their engines, which had been heated continuously the day before. At the beginning of the offensive, two Mark IIs had been destroyed side by side in the Russian bombardment. The front was once again threatening to give way. We lay in our trenches, our eyes reduced to slits, waiting for the hordes of red infantry, which would surely be coming soon. For the moment, our machine guns and panzerfausts were quiet, leaving the way clear for our heavy artillery and our tanks. Adroitly camouflaged, the Tigers lay waiting, with their engines idling. Almost every time a Russian tank came into range, a sharp, strident burst set it on fire. The Russians were moving towards us slowly, sure of themselves, firing at random. Their tactic of demoralisation would have worked if there had not been so many plumes of black smoke rising against the pale February sky. Our 37s and Panzerfausts, designed to be used at almost point-blank range, were scarcely called on. The first wave of Soviet armour was consumed 500 yards from our first positions, nailed down by the concentrated fire of our Tigers and Panthers and heavy anti-tank guns. The Tiger was an astonishing fortress. Enemy fire seemed to have almost no effect on its shell, which, at the front, was five and a half inches thick. Its only weakness was its relative immobility. A second Russian wave followed closely after the first, more dense than the first and accompanied by a swarm of infantry, which posed a serious threat. We waited, dry-mouthed, our guns jammed against our shoulders and our grenades in easy reach. Our hearts were pounding. Suddenly, like a miracle, thirty of our planes flew over, as promised, the squadron from Vinitsa was attacking. This particular job was easy for them, and every bomb hit home. A cry of Siegel der Luftwaffe ran so loudly from our trenches that the pilots might almost have heard it. We opened fire with everything we had, but the Russian offensive kept coming despite overwhelming losses. Our tanks drove at the stricken enemy with an ardour worthy of 1941. The noise became unbearable, the air was thick with bitter fumes and smoke, and the smells of gunpowder and burned gasoline. Our shouts mingled with the shouts of the Russians, who were reeling under the unexpected resistance. We were able to watch the magnificent progress of our Tigers pulverising the enemy tanks before they were able to complete a half turn. The Luftwaffe attacked again with rockets and 20mm cannons. The Russian rout was hidden by a thick curtain of luminous smoke. The Russian artillery kept on firing at our lines, causing several deaths which we scarcely noticed. However, their guns were soon overrun by their own retreating troops and fell silent. A second wave of German planes, an undreamed of extra luxury, completed the Russian debacle. We hugged each other in excitement, bursting with joy. For a year now, we had been retreating before an enemy whose numerical superiority was constantly increasing. Lenson was shouting like a man possessed by demons. I told you we'd do it! I told you we'd do it! Our achievement was mentioned in special bulletins. The front on the Romanian border had held. After months of sustained attack and terrible cold, German Romanian troops had once again pushed back the Russian offensive and destroyed quantities of enemy material. The mass of broken, twisted metal strewn with corpses which lay in front of us was visible proof of what we'd done. Along a front of 200 miles, the Red Army had launched 16 attacks inside of a month. Taking into account the three weeks of inactivity during which all operations were impossible, these 16 attacks had all occurred inside the space of one week. Five points had borne the brunt of the Russian effort, and at only one had the Russians come close to success. The front was broken to the south, but this thrust was cut off, and the Russian troops were either annihilated or taken prisoner. In our sector, all the lines had held, and we felt very proud. 
We had proved once again that with adequate material and a certain minimum preparation, we could hold off an enemy of greatly superior size, whose frenzied efforts were never intelligently employed. The veteran Wiener had often remarked on this Russian failing at difficult moments. At the sight of an enemy tank in flames, he would bare his teeth in a wide, wolfish grin. What a damned fool, he would say, to let himself get caught like that. It's only their numbers that will get us some day. There were 30 iron crosses for the Großdeutschland and as many for the small tank regiment, which also earned the honour. Well, it's a. I, I remember reading this book years ago and... You know, it's one of those ones that it, it just does have a profound effect on you, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it's 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 pretty dense, but what they go through is just horrendous, and it makes you yeah. realise. I mean, we were talking about kind of Spike Milligan having his Christmas dinner and stuff like that. There's there's just a lot less of the well, you've got morale you've, boosters. There's an awful lot for, of for the German. There's army. an awful lot of here's a pair of boots, here's a rifle. Now now yeah. um, hold back those Russians. Mm. Uh, it, 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 the, and you know we. It's brutal, isn't it? Let's it's face absolutely it. brutal. And when you, I think, when you read a lot about, you know, um, the, the super organised Wehrmacht and how efficient they were and all that sort of thing, and then you, and then you, you read this, you sort of think, all oh, right, okay, I, I don't know how you square those two, um, uh, uh, quite competing <laughs> ways of looking at what was happening. Yeah, yeah. it's a good one. It's anyway, a happy New Year, Merry Christmas. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>